So I'm delighted to introduce our principal speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Rowan Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams is a native of South Wales and studied initially in Cambridge. Richard Conrad's not here to cheer when Cambridge is mentioned, so I'll do it on his mm -hmm. behalf. <laughs> uh, and what could be better than studying in Cambridge? Doing postgraduate study here in Oxford, where you studied at Wadham College initially. Um, Dr. Williams trained for the Anglican priesthood at Murfield College in what well, the old Murf Murfield College in Yorkshire, and has had a distinguished career. Too many appointments and so on for me to mention, but um, obviously we all know he was the Archbishop of Canterbury and is now the current Master of Modelling College. Um, Dr. Williams' writings have really been, I'd say, a high point of Anglican theology of the last 30 years and cover a huge range of topics. Normally you have to be a Dominican to write as many books as he's written. <laughs> <laughs> And not only that, but also to cover the huge variety of topics. And in many ways, what, uh, what Dr. Dot Williams does is he brings together voices which may be seen to be competing, but which can enter into dialogue and conversation if brought together in the right way. So I think he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's really a figure who, as it were, brings a balanced view, but also a kind of view in which we can see actually how dialogue is possible. So whether he's writing on Luther or Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas or Tyndale, um, it's always very illuminating, his writings. Um, recent books have included work on Augustine and work on the rule of St. Benedict. So um, I don't think I really have to say much more, but, uh, but the, the, the other thing just to mention is that um, Dr. Do William is also a poet. So he is a, he's somebody who's not just as it were a student of literature, but is himself actually a, pr a practitioner of literature. And in his writings, not only does he bring together different theological viewpoints, but also brings together literature, literary themes and theology in, in an illuminating way that very few people can. So I'm very delighted to, to welcome you tonight. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this extremely exciting series. I'm really delighted to be here and looking forward to further conversation. So let me begin with three short extracts from The Merchant of Venice, from three key moments in the play. Act one, scene three. Enter Bassanio with Shylock the Jew. 3,000 ducats. Well, I sir, for three months. <coughs> for three months. Well, for the which, as I told you, Antonio shall be bound. Antonio shall become bound. Well. Act four, scene one. So can I give no reason, nor I will not, more than a lodged hate and certain loathing I bear, Antonio, that I follow thus a losing suit against him. Are you answered? This is no answer, thou unfeeling man, to excuse the current of thy cruelty. I am not bound to please thee with my answers. Act five, scene one. I thank you, madam. Give welcome to my friend. This is the man, this is Antonio, to whom I am so infinitely bound. You should in all sense be much bound to him, for as I hear he was much bound for you. Binding, being bound, the reality of the bond. These are themes which occur and recur again and again in this curious and troubling drama, The Merchant of Venice. And in my reflections this afternoon, I want to look at how some of that language of binding works to create the energy and movement of the play, to think about one particular way in which its implications are followed through by Shakespeare in a slightly different mode 
and to connect that with a theological theme, which I've referred to very generally as a sort of parodic sacramentality. Now, it's no news that a great many of Shakespeare's plays are plays about plays. I don't simply mean that they are plays in which certain characters engage in dramatic action, as in Hamlet, or as in that strange framing device in The Taming of the Shrew, or as in the disastrous amateur dramatic production in Love's Labour's Lost. They're plays about the nature of drama, the nature of representation, the nature of script writing. A play binds its agents to a script. To know that you are acting in a play is to know that in some important sense you are bound. And perhaps as that first extract suggests, perhaps the attraction to Shylock of the idea of the bond, which becomes so obsessively important to him as time goes on, is that for once Shylock is the dramaturge. He is not the actor speaking someone else's lines. He is shaping the destiny of someone else. He sets the terms. He dictates the meanings. 3,000 ducats and Antonio bound. Antonio, whose characterization of Shylock is so relentlessly hostile and negative. Antonio, who has the freedom to say who Shylock is in the world of Christian Venice, is not going to be free, but bound. And Shylock is the one who binds him. And ultimately, of course, that's a very literal binding. Antonio is bound in prison and in court, and we're left in no doubt at all of the physicality of this binding. We see Antonio being taken to prison. We see him bound, held down in court, waiting for Shylock's knife. So that one of the themes that's running under the surface of The Merchant of Venice, I suggest, is Shylock's bid for agency. Shylock's bid to be the dramaturge. And that inversion of dramatic power, Shylock writing the script, not Antonio, not Christian Venice, that is to Shylock part of what will finally settle for him the injustice and inhumanity of a situation where his voice is systematically silenced. But here's the, well, I use the word cautiously, but here's the tragic paradox in the evolution of the play. As Shylock pursues this goal of binding Antonio and implicitly binding Christian Venice for once to his priority, his agenda, Shylock himself becomes more deeply bound and less free. Look at the trial scene. I will have my bond, he says again and again. Obsessed, trapped and frozen, we could say, by the bond he has entered into. He has no other choices in the trial. And he makes that very clear. He has bound himself. And he says so very dramatically, again in 4.1, when challenged as to what else he might accept. But he protests to the court that he is bound by the oath he's taken in the sight of heaven. Therefore, he has no alternative. And that means that in the trial, the trial in the face and in the presence of Christian Venice, he is in fact, like it or not, once again, cast in a drama not of his creation. By his insistence on, on his bond and the justice of the bond, he walks straight into the ideological or imaginative trap 
set for him by Christian Venice. Because he stands for law and not mercy, and everybody knows that that's what Jews stand for. In other words, Shylock's binding of Antonio, his sense of his own commitment to the oath he's taken, becomes another twist of the Christian system that keeps him in bondage. He is, as I say, already cast. His part is already written. And the oath that he cannot break is an oath that condemns him to stand for justice, not mercy. Oath-breaking is a theme which crops up at several points in the play. There are lots of oaths around. Um, Portia has to consider whether she is bound by her father's decision about her fate, and she comes to the conclusion that she must accept that she has, as it were, implicitly bound herself. She is on oath not to disclose the terms of the, the box test to her suitors. She is also written in to a script not of her own making. And the oaths that are taken later on, the promise to protect and preserve the rings given by Portia and Nerissa to their new husbands, those oaths are broken and the results are not as tragic as they might be, but they are a real reflection still of the theme of oath-making and oath-breaking which pervade the play. I don't think it's entirely an accident that Portia's first words in the play are by my troth, on my oath, that is, by my faith. You can't just break oaths without in some sense breaking yourself. So Shylock believes, so other characters believe. But Shylock's tragedy is the kind of oath that he has made. The bond to exact the debt that is owed to him. And one of the most interesting and original things that Shakespeare does in this play, I believe, is to help us see how the mechanism of debt which is bound up in all this language about binding, how the mechanism of debt creates victims and how the victim intelligence works and how, while we may feel appropriate pity and empathy for the victim, we also see the self-destructiveness of this particular trajectory in the victim intelligence which involves revenge and so forth. So binding and freeing run through the play in a number of ways. I've mentioned Portia's unfreedom, her scriptedness. And Shylock himself refers in the trial scene, rather chillingly, to the fact of slavery. He points out to those in the court that they are, many of them, slave owners. They understand what it is to live in a world of serious, systematic unfreedom. And Sherlock is able to appeal, ironically, to the fact of slavery to make them understand what it is to have bought somebody and incorporated them as objects, as actors in another's drama, not subjects. Shylock has bought Antonio and so can do what he likes with him. That is part of what he says to the court in, as I say, a rather chilling passage. What judgment shall I dread doing no wrong? This is the 4-1 again. You have among you many a purchased slave, which, like your asses and your dogs and mules, you use in abject and in slavish parts, because you bought them. 
Shall I say to you, let them be free, marry them to your heirs? Why sweat they under burdens? Let their beds be made as soft as yours, and let their pallets be seasoned with such viands. You will answer, the slaves are ours. So do I answer you. The pound of flesh which I demand of him is dearly bought, tis mine, and I will have it. Charlotte has bought Antonio as surely as the Venetians around him have bought their slaves. And as surely as Portia's father has offered Portia for sale to those who will buy in the terms set out in the oath which binds Portia and her suitors. We don't then begin to understand The Merchant of Venice unless we see how it's a play about the tensions arising in different kinds of unfreedom. That's a very basic insight about the play. But more specifically, we're invited to see just how difficult it is to overturn the patterns of bondage and unfreedom. Because to overturn them simply as a matter of inverting relations of ownership, relations of power and domination, binds you still deeper into the pattern of ownership and dehumanizing that goes with that. Can Shylock ever, in fact, liberate himself from bondage? One of the most interesting essays I've read recently on The Merchant is by uh, an American Jewish critic in the Jewish Review of Books a couple of months ago, pointing out that Shylock is, as he puts it, a would-be tragic hero condemned to be comic. Not in the sense of condemned to be funny, but Shylock attempting to be, for like the hero of his own drama, in fact reinforces the comic, abusive and derisive stereotype of the Jew. The Jew who is bound to justice, not mercy. And as Hillman, the author of this article notes, and as others have noted, this would have been much more evident on the stage at the time than it would be now for us. We're accustomed to seeing staged Shylocks with a considerable degree of moral and physical dignity. But a Jew on stage at this time would still have had some of the medieval appurtenances of Jews in the mystery plays. Almost certainly the red wig and almost certainly the false nose. You have to imagine, therefore, the visible clown, the butt of everyone's mockery and contempt, seeking to make a bid for heroic and tragic seriousness. Gareth Armstrong, who has written a very entertaining and perceptive book called The Case for Shylock, as a, partly as a result of his own experience playing the part and creating a one-man show around the figure of Shylock, has described how he came to the decision that when he was doing his one-man show, he should, at least at the beginning, come on in that classic comic costume. And it's certainly very interesting to imagine the effect of a visibly comic figure coming out with some of Shylock's lines, the great Hath Not a Jew Eyes speech. And also, I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys, another of those unforgettable, unpredictable, uniquely Shakespearean lines. But even in that very great speech, the Hath Not a Jew Eyes speech in 3 1, we have Shylock saying also that he has been taught revenge by Christians. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? 
And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why, revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Not only, in other words, is Shylock bound in to the Christian story. The Christian story for him is essentially one of revenge. The Jewish experience of the Christian narrative is the experience of what is horribly called in a very popular medieval text, the revenging of the savior. Solidarity in pain, which Shylock appeals to, if you prick us, do we not bleed, becomes paradoxically solidarity in vengefulness. The entire Christian pattern of anti-Semitism is understood by Shylock as a fundamental feature of what Christians have to teach, and it is vengeance towards the stranger. Shylock is bound into that narrative. He experiences the Christian story as that kind of story, and he is taught by it to revenge. In other words, what he hears in his Christian environment is that mercy is for people like us. Justice may be argued about and sought by strangers. Mercy is for Gentiles which is why there's a deep irony in the end of the Duke's appeal to Shylock in the trial scene. But touched with human gentleness and love, says the Duke, forgive a moiety of the principal, glancing an eye of pity on his losses that have of late so huddled on his back enough to press a royal merchant down and pluck commiseration of his state from brassy bosoms and rough hearts of flint, from sub stubborn Turks and Tartars never trained to offices of tender courtesy. We all expect a gentle answer, Jew. We all expect a Gentile answer. We all expect you to behave as if you were one of us, because mercy is for people like us. So that's the first part of what I want to draw out from The Merchant of Venice. The language of binding and unfreedom, so pervasive in the play, is a language also casting light on what happens to Shylock what he does to himself by internalizing the Christian narrative of vengeance, as he sees it, binding himself by oath to that imperative of vengeance, the oath in heaven, a very, very strong phrase. But now, if we were to look at some of the scriptural background, the deep background of this, we might remember that bonds and covenants in the Bible are routinely sealed in eating together. Bassanio invites Shylock to eat with them, and Shylock replies or says aside, I'm not quite sure, that he has obviously no interest in sharing the table with those with whom he is making a covenant, making a bond. If it please you to dine with us, says Bassanio, yes, to smell pork, to eat of the habitation which your prophet the Nazarite conjured the devil into. <laughs> I will buy with you, sell with you, talk with you, walk with you, and so following, but I will not eat with you, drink with you, nor pray with you. The covenant is not to be sealed in a common table, as it is so often scripturally. And yet the imagery of feeding abounds in the play. Absorbing the flesh of the other 
as a sign of ownership or power is an image that is found at very many points. And of course, Shylock himself metaphorizes his new power over the bound Christian by saying so vividly to Jessica that he goes to feed upon the prodigal Christian. Act two, scene five. I am bid forth to supper, Jessica. There are my keys. But wherever should I go? I am not bid for love. They flatter me, but yet I'll go in hate to feed upon the prodigal Christian. And that sense that Shylock is absorbing, overpowering Antonio in feeding upon him, feeding upon his flesh, I'll come back to that in a moment, becomes, of course, much more acute when his own flesh, Jessica, is stolen away. It's not only Shylock who uses the language. Bassanio himself speaks of feeding Antonio to risk on his behalf. I have engaged myself to a dear friend, he says to Portia. In engaged my friend to his mere enemy to feed my means. Antonio becomes a source of feeding for Bassanio, and the initially powerless Bassanio now has Antonio in some sense in his power. Antonio is part of Bassanio's drama. He's feeding his means, and he does this by giving him into the power of the enemy for Shylock also to feed upon. There's a benign use of this feeding imagery very fleetingly in the brief exchange in 3.5 between Lorenzo and Jessica. Even such a husband hast thou of me as she is for a wife. Nay, but ask my opinion too of that. I will anon. First let us go to dinner. Nay, let me praise you while I have a stomach. No, praise thee, let it serve. Pray thee, let it serve for table talk. Then howsoever thou speakst, among other things, I shall digest it. But that benign, playful use of feeding is, of course, overshadowed by the fact that Jessica's flesh, Shylock's flesh, has been sold now to the Christian world for food, for profit. So it's overshadowed by that prevailing imagery of feeding on the flesh of the other as a governing symbol for what power, dominance, the agenda setting of the dramaturge amounts to. Antonio has in every sense lent his body to risk, consumption, destruction. I once did lend my body for his wealth, which but for him that had your husband's ring had quite miscarried. I dare be bound again my soul upon the forfeit, that your lord will never more break faith advisedly. Notice again the association of binding with giving over the body, giving over yourself to be the other's food. Bassanio has said that he would be willing to accept a physical mutilation if it got him off the hook for his betrayal of Portia, why, I were best to cut my left hand off and swear I lost the ring defending it, which is another, as it were, parodic and not quite serious, dig at the same kind of language about flesh, its destruction and its mutilation. And of course, as powerfully as any image is Sherlock's response when he's asked why he wants Antonio's flesh to bait fish withal. If it feed nothing else, it will feed my revenges. So the language of unfreedom, of being bound, seems to tie itself into this language of consumption. One way of activating the bond, the bondedness, 
of the subaltern figure, the powerless figure, is to cast them as food for the powerful, for the successful, the normative. The Jew must become food for Christian Venice. And Shylock's attempt, as I say, to invert that pattern means that Antonio must be made food for him. To bait to fish with all, to feed his revenges. In other words, the benign narrative of covenant and covenant meal, so crucial in scriptural narrative in the Judeo-Christian world, has here become a doubled, intensified slavery. Covenant, rather than being an assurance of fidelity, has become a self-imprisonment in oath, in promise in heaven. The covenant meal, which seals the covenant of grace, the covenant of mutuality, is set aside in favour of the consumption and destruction of the other. The pattern of destructive action, bonded, bound action, is a pattern of ownership and ultimately consumption. For the fleshly body, that means death and disappearance. So stepping back just for a moment from the detail of this, it's almost as if that central drama in The Merchant of Venice about Shylock's bond sets up a parody of the great life-giving myths of both Judaism and Christianity. Instead of the life-giving covenant of grace and promise, we have the bond that paralyzes and crushes. Instead of the life-giving covenant meal of the Eucharist, we have that consumption of the flesh of the powerless within the context of the bond. Shakespeare quite often likes to use language of consuming the flesh of another as an image of deep and traumatic violence. Humanity perforce must feed upon itself like monsters of the deep, as we hear in King Lear, and it's a pervasive image. Shakespeare, as we were saying in the panel discussion earlier on, is certainly not somebody who is dramatizing a theological agenda. But this could be taken as an instance of what I earlier called Shakespeare using scriptural and theological themes to think with. What is it in the human relations of injustice and domination that, so to speak, condemns us again and again to engage in parodies of the true signs of grace? Not only parodies, but destructive and toxic parodies of grace. You might even go so far as to say that in the scene in the court, we have a parody of the binding of Isaac. We have Antonio bound and Shylock's knife poised over him. And had I more time, I'd be very interested to set that scene alongside the dramatizings of the Abraham and Isaac story in the medieval mystery cycles, the last minute rescue of the bound victim. But rather than that being as it is in the Abraham and Isaac story, a sign of grace, it is of course a sign of abject humiliation and defeat for Shylock. What are we to make of Shylock's ultimate fate in the play. Readers, critics, audiences still debate this. It may well be that in its original setting, this was almost universally seen as a sign of mercy. Sherlock, after all, is told that his life is forfeit. 
and he's then spared on condition that he be baptized. And a lot depends on how you hear those words, those chilling words at the end, I am content, when Sherlock hears his sentence. What sayest thou, Jew? I am content. Does he mean that he is content? Is he, as I sometimes think, deliberately echoing or parodying Antonia's words just a few lines earlier where he says that he is content to grant mercy to Shylock. I can imagine a glance across the stage at that point. Shylock, I am content. Hmm? What do you think? <laughs> but Shakespeare is too complex a dramatist, I think, for us simply to read this as a sign of mercy. We know something of what the cost has already been to Shylock in terms of that self-destructive binding into the pattern of vengeance and the inversion of power. We have seen that his attempt to consume the flesh of his enemy is motivated by the stripping away of his own flesh in Jessica's elopement. And the parodic covenant and parodic Eucharist that is evoked in these ways becomes focused on the parodic binding of Isaac and indeed the parodic Calvary of the court scene as a dramatic pivot in the play. I think there, therefore, that the Shylock strand in The Merchant of Venice, and it's not the only strand, the Shylock strand puts before us some of the questions that arise, as I hinted earlier, in the history plays. Questions about the nature of power, questions about the effect of power, and about the insistent, obsessive drift in human relations towards cannibalism, that is, towards the consumption and destruction of the stranger, the one who is not in the covenant of mercy. It's about anti-Semitism, yes, though Shakespeare would not have recognised the category. It's about anti-Semitism in the sense of what it is like to live in a society where there is a single absolute controlling narrative which eats the identity of every other identity, of every other subject around and every other community around. To see it in those terms is then to see it as a play about, in part, the corruption of power, and in part, therefore, about the misunderstanding of bondedness, oaths, promise, and fidelity. Because an oath is ultimately about being faithful to oneself. It's a play, then, about the extraordinary difficulty of being faithful to oneself without binding oneself into a story which will finally consume one's own flesh, as Shylock is finally consumed by and absorbed into the world he has been struggling against with such passion and such anger. It's also a play about Bassanio and Portia. It's a play with a number of romantic, comedic elements. It has, up to a point, as happy an ending as any of the great comedies have, which is not saying much, it has to be said. And it mustn't be reduced simply to the story of Shylock. It's so frequently pointed out that, of course, the Shylock scene comes well before the end of the play, the, the court scene, and we are not expected, therefore, to treat it as the climax and the centre of the entire play's logic. But it's placing its language, its verbal interconnection with the other evocations of unfreedom and consumption that are around, tell us, I think, that in this, as in other comedies, Shakespeare is very self-consciously problematizing the relations between human beings when they involve power and the scripting 
of the life of another. And that's why, coming back to the point at which I started, this is indeed a play about plays. It's a play about dramaturgy, about the power of the writer, the power of the imagination, the power of the creator. And how that toxic and destructive outworking of power can be overturned is not Shakespeare's object of exposition here. But I like to think that simply in creating these bleak and dark parodies of what I call the life-giving myths of Judaism and Christianity, Shakespeare, like any good parodist, invites us to look harder at what is being parodied and ask what is life-giving about those myths. Thank you. Of course, religion in, um, in the English of the period still could mean <coughs> a, a binding duty. Um, since you think it a religion to to be faithful to this or that. That's a phrase, some one trial account. Um, so th that may be around, I don't, I don't know. With Shakespeare, I think you can always give him, a, give him the benefit of the doubt and having, without having an illusion in mind. Bind on earth and bind in heaven. An oath, an oath in heaven, says Sharak. I just wonder whether that's, again, a verbal echo, but I, I don't know what I'd make of it in terms of the overall argument here. It might be that, again, Shakespeare is inviting us to think of what, what it might be to be bound in heaven by a decision on earth. Shylock is certainly saying, my binding of myself, my religion is in heaven. It is, it is fixed. And again, the question is, is put back, is that what it means? Is, is this about my decision, which binds, as it were, binds God? Um, which is almost what Shylock wants to say, because God, God's freedom to show mercy is not much in focus in Shylock's mind, and for very understandable reasons. So, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll just process that a bit. I, I like the thought. That's interesting because certainly um, Lear at the beginning of the play is operating very much with an economy of debt, isn't he? And he is assessing what is owed to the daughters and what they owe him. And there's a very clear sense that the, the rupture at the beginning is partly because Cordelia, if you like, takes him at his word and says to him, so you're interested in what we owe one another. Well, I owe you my duty as a daughter. What else do you think? You know, do you think I owe you something absolute, something eternal? Lear responds, of course, by swearing an oath, which ends with the words, be this perpetual. He wants an oath in heaven. So I think he's, he's upping the stakes there with, with that oath. Again, I have to think more about that, but I'm, I'm just kind of responding to... Um, I think that's right. I, th I think the, uh, the tainted weather thing, which has attracted a lot of attention in criticism, is, among other things, a, a kind of rolling the pitch for the idea of Antonio as a victim. And, and he, well, he is bound for his friend. He gives his flesh for his friend. He is, I think, a, a kind of Paschal lamb, therefore. Um, the, the fact that that line may also, because of the word tainted, um, 
have something to do in Shakespeare's imagination with the homoerotic subtext with Bassanio, I'm sure. But I don't think that um, Shakespeare would have wanted us to miss something there about sacrificial lambs. Mm -hmm. oh, I think it, it, you know, if you look at the, the relationship with the Abraham and Isaac uh, plays, mm. also there's hovering, hovering around always, I think, the play of the sacrament as well. Mm. And if you, see, if you see that, there's foreshadowing uh, the Christian sacrifice, the, the sacrifice of Christ, and you see that within the Eucharist, as a, as 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 the, as the sacrifice, and then all the controversy about flesh and blood uh, uh, over what the Eucharist is about. There's, there's a there's a line of thought going through there, whether it's a whether it's a a conscious one or yeah. a subconscious. That, that's that's a really good point, I think, because it's as as if if you start out on one train of imagery, you almost, as you say, subconsciously draw in yeah. and stuff. You can't have the flesh without the blood. Correct. You know, that, that's Correct. in the court scene. Yeah. Quite. Yeah. And, that, and that's linking in to this, the whole controversy, it's a Eucharistic controversy about, yes. about transubstantiation and, and the whole and nature and whether you a, a take cup the... cup for the laity and Correct. all sorts of Correct. things. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anything well, I, I think also possibly I'm the tainted weather of the flock. Now there are bits in the prophets, I think in Malachi and elsewhere, where there are complaints from God about being offered a tainted uh, weather. Yeah. The, the sacrificial lamb must be without blemish, the pastor without blemish. And Tony is a blemished yeah. sheep. And it's almost as if we're being told, therefore, this is going to be a story which is going to look very like a, a sacrificial Christ-like story. Antonia is going to have that about him. But don't drop your critical faculties here. Ant <laughs> Antonio is also a blemished lamb. And I don't think that's particularly about um, what I call the homoerotic subtext. I think it's just that Antonio is, is a complex human figure, not the oh, savior. Okay. So yeah. Shakespeare almost, as some, some of the young would say, messing with our heads here and <laughs> saying, <laughs> okay, this, this is going to be a, a story that will remind you quite a lot of some themes in theology, but don't be, don't be fooled by me. And it reminds me in that sense of the way in which in Dostoevsky's The Idiot, Dostoevsky does something very similar with the figure of Prince Mishkin. He sets up this figure to look like Christ so that our expectations are that this is going to be a sacrificial redemptive figure. When he describes Mishkin, he describes him as having long fair hair parted in the middle and a little beard and a long nose and large eyes, and you think, yeah. And so people in the, the novel say of Mishkin, haven't we seen you somewhere before? <laughs> of course they have. <laughs> He's on every wall in Russia. <laughs> but the point is that he is a, a tainted weather of the flock equally. And part of the theological and Christian force of the idiot, sorry, I can go on about Dostoevsky all night. Um, part of that is exactly that Dostoevsky is teasing us, inviting us to see, yep, this is very like it, but it isn't, is it? So what's the difference? Go and think what the real thing is like. Yeah, I think Chaucer's uh, phrase, don't take in earnest what is meant for game. Yeah. You know, it's hovering around there. Anything? From this play. <laughs> well, let's let's say they're all they're all part of a primal soup <laughs> of, of reflection on this. Um, I'm certainly interested, politically speaking, in scapegoating mechanisms. I'm certainly interested in the way in which our media create a script about the national story, which was very very potent in that debate and how, in a, an unfortunate way, much the better story was told by the Brexit campaigners than by their opponents. But that then became the canonical story mm. for which the other, the stranger, the minority, was written out of the, the play, or rather written into it as a subordinate and instrumentalized reality. So as I say, it's, it's all sort of joined up somewhere. 
Uh, and with that, thank you thank again, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.